Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Very glad to welcome back Eric Peters, who runs Eric Peters Autos, which you can check out at ericpetersautos.com or epautos.com. Let's talk about some of your new car reviews because it's that time of year again and you've been posting them on a regular basis for some weeks now. So what has stood out to you as you've tested them this year? Anything new for this year that particularly catches your fancy? Well, I don't know if catches my fancy would be the right way to describe it, but there's a very, very interesting trend um, that's happening. And it is essentially the uh, extinction of six-cylinder engines in mass-market cars, um, as well as diesel engines, obviously. You and I have talked about that before. But because of all the pressure coming from Washington about fuel economy, um, mid-sized cars, family cars, cars like the Honda Accord, for example, Mazda 6, uh, no longer offer six-cylinder engines even as an option because those engines get slightly poorer fuel economy than the four-cylinder versions. So you're finding that these cars now are coming only with four-cylinder engines and for the most part with turbocharged four-cylinder engines, which are more maintenance-intensive as the miles go by. And in addition to that, they're starting to put, if you can believe this, 10-speed transmissions behind some of these four-cylinder engines. Uh, the Accord in 2018 will come with a 10-speed automatic transmission. And again, they're doing that because of these incremental improvements in gas mileage that they can manage that way uh, in order to meet the federal government's corporate average fuel economy mandates. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that about that at all because I've, I've driven only six cylinders for years. I guess I'm so car illiterate after I realized there's a difference and it matters and it even an idiot can feel it. And when I'm out on the highway, and especially when I'm merging onto the highway, I sure want that six-cylinder. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're trying to maintain the level of power and performance uh, from the four-cylinder engines by going with the turbocharger. And the theory is that, uh, you know, when you need the power, you press on the gas, and the turbocharger boosts the power of the engine. But when you're just driving along, the engine will get better gas mileage because it's a smaller engine, a four-cylinder versus a six but in the real world, you find that these little engines have to work harder than the larger engine, and you wind up discovering that the gas mileage difference is negligible. I, I test drive these cars every week. I've been doing it for years, so I can tell you this from my own personal experience. The real-world mileage difference is, is inconsequential. But down the road, if that turbo goes, and eventually it will, and the intercooler and the plumbing and all the other associated parts that go with it, the repair costs for that uh, are forbidding, whereas a V6 doesn't have those additional components. So there's no chance that you'll have to pay for a turbo, uh, you know, at 80, 90,000 miles down the road. Wow. I did not expect you to answer this way. I had no idea that this was happening. Well, with that huge caveat, then, are there particular cars, nevertheless, that you say, well, given these terrible trends, this one's not so bad? Oh, yeah. They, you know, the, the manufacturers are doing... Uh, you know, the work of Atlas supporting the world, uh, they have to deal with all this rigmarole coming out of Washington, and yet they still manage to produce some pretty phenomenal vehicles, despite it all. A friend of mine recently got the little Fiat 500 hatchback, and she got a tremendous deal on it because Fiat is having some difficulty selling those cars. Not because they're bad cars by any means, they just haven't done a very effective job of marketing them, as Americans in general are somewhat averse to very small cars. But it's a cute, fun little thing, and she picked it up for thousands of dollars underneath the MSRP sticker price. She couldn't be happier with it. It's fun. It gets great gas mileage. It's very space efficient on the inside, and you can park the thing almost anywhere that a skateboard will fit. Let's say 30000 and below in that category. Where should people look? If you had to name two or three. Okay, I'll name one in particular. I'm a huge fan of the Mazda 6. And that is a midsize sedan that competes with the blue chip models, being the, the Toyota Camry and the Honda Accord. The Mazda 6, even though it no longer offers a six-cylinder engine, as we talked about a few moments ago, is it's a striking-looking car. Mazda builds just beautiful-looking cars, and their ride and handling is exceptional. They manage to provide a balance of both handling and ride quality that usually you have to pick one or the other. The Camry, for example, is a great family car, but it's really squishy and soft. And if you're somebody who enjoys driving at a faster pace, it's probably not going to please you. The Honda Accord, on the other hand, is, is, a, is a fun and aggressive and sporty car, but it, it's a little rough riding, too. Um, the Mazda 6 manages to give you both of those attributes in the same vehicle, along with really good gas mileage and just a really good vehicle overall, too.
All right. Well, those are great recommendations. Now, in the old days, which was like a year ago, on your GPS, you might have a feature that it would show you what the speed limit of the road you were on was, which was a helpful feature, by the way, because it's not easy when you're driving to always be aware of that. So that feature would be built into the GPS. But now we're starting to see street signs and their contents being displayed in the car, and the car is aware of what the signs are telling you. So what's the potential problem? Well, the technology is called traffic sign recognition. And as you described, essentially what it does, the car is aware through the GPS uh, of your position in real time as you're driving, and it also is aware of the speed limit on the given stretch of road. I'm not opposed to information being displayed on the screen, okay? I I know what the speed limit is on this road. But the next step in the evolution is if the car starts to get angry and nag you, uh, if you're driving faster than the speed limit, even if it's one mile over the speed limit, the little icon, which duplicates the physical sign, so you have an actual icon that looks like the speed limit sign, the white with the black numerals, uh, goes red, you know, to, uh, to, to hector you. Oh, boy, you're speeding. And I'm certain that the next step is that the vehicle is going to actually intervene in the same way that vehicles now will already intervene to brake when the vehicle thinks it's time for you to brake and will attempt to correct your steering for you as well, superseding your inputs. I'm convinced that that's where, you know, that's where things are going. That's been the trend with all of this technology over the past several years. See, I like to think of the car as being sort of on my side. Like it gives me information sometimes just to encourage me and to support me. I don't like the idea that the car is carrying out the agenda of some foreign force. I like to feel like my car and I have a kind of kinship here. I don't want to think my car is some kind of fifth column in my life. I, I agree. Exactly. That's my objection to all of this. You've heard of Cass Sunstein, right? Oh, yeah. He was one of Obama's advisors, and he, you know, he came up with this concept of nudging people, you know, which nudge them with a bayonet, you know, force them to do what these technocrats, these people who believe that they know better than the rest of us how we should operate, ought to do. Not leave it up to us to make decisions for ourselves, but to intervene and to direct us and to control us. That's the thing that I object to. You have a piece called One Electric Car That Makes Sense. Uh, what is that car, and what do you mean by that? Well, it's the Chevy Volt, and what I mean by that is it's the only electric car that isn't functionally gimped. It actually works. Uh, it meets uh, functional and economic criteria, and uh, naturally, that's why it's not being promoted. Instead, they're promoting all of these electric cars that are functionally impaired, and, and severely so, and that make absolutely no economic sense. The Volt is not tied to uh, an electric umbilical cord. It has a very small gas engine that it carries around, but it differs from a hybrid. The gas engine in the Volt is there chiefly to serve as a backup generator to provide electricity for the electric drivetrain. You can drive that thing exclusively on electricity for about 50 miles. I've done it. I've test-driven the vehicle. Um, And then if you exceed that range, the gas engine will kick on and it will provide electricity to power the batteries and electric motors. So the thing works. It doesn't have any range limitations. You could, you could drive it 400 miles if you want to. And uh, you don't have to sit there and wait for 30 to 45 minutes to recharge it to 80%. No, that's not ever talked about. And that assumes a fast charger. It, to me, it's bizarre to imagine that we're going to have a society in which hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of electric cars are going to have to pause every single day for 30 to 45 minutes and wait at a fast charger to recover 80% of their uh, their capacity to drive. You can imagine going to McDonald's and waiting 30 to 45 minutes for a hamburger. But the funny thing is you don't hear that disability talked about a whole lot. All you hear is the the wonders of uh, green technology, and, and but we don't hear about what you just said. Yeah, it's, in my opinion, it is not merely incompetence, it's malfeasance, it's purposeful and deliberate. These issues are well known to journalists who are covering this issue, and yet nobody's asking the the hard and legitimate questions about electric cars. I'm not anti-electric cars, but I am pro-truth, and I think that people have a right to be aware of these functional issues, which are significant. You can refuel a gas engine car in five minutes, and that is what our entire system is geared up to deal with. You know, you, you go to work, you, you leave work, you, have a, you need to put some gas in the vehicle, you, you stop at the gas station, you put the fuel in, and in five minutes you're back on the road. The idea that people are going to stop for 30 to 45 minutes, and again, that assumes one of these fast chargers, which are high-voltage uh, charging stations, which do not exist. 
an entire infrastructure that will have to be built in order to have these fast chargers such that hundreds of thousands or millions of electric cars could plug in. It's crazy. Let's go on to your piece called Tire Tyranny, because I, so let's start off with this. I go in to buy tires today. Something different is asked of me than would have been asked uh, a, a couple of years ago. And what is that and why? Well, you know, they actually don't even ask anymore. They, um, oh, they, they just go out and do it. called the VIN, the Vehicle Identification Number. If you look at the corner of the dashboard near the windshield in the upper part of the dash, um, you will see essentially a barcode, just like the barcode on the, the things that you buy at the grocery store. And it serves the same purpose. It carries all of the information about your particular vehicle, when it was made, which engine it came with, which transmission it came with, all of the options it has, and so on and so on. And these it's typically these big chain shops right now will scan that VIN and then restrict you from buying tires that you might wish to buy, that which they will claim were not original equipment or don't meet some specification. For example, if your car originally came with a tire that had a V speed rating, and on my site, I've got a little chart that shows what these specific ratings are. The V rating is for safe travel at speeds up to 149 miles an hour. Now, the key word there being sustained. You have to drive at sustained speeds that fast or more before it becomes an issue. Well, some people might elect to buy a, a tire with an H rating, which is up to 130 miles an hour sustained travel because it's less expensive. And generally, the tire with the, the lesser speed rating is going to be a bit softer riding, so you have a more comfortable ride and longer lasting because the compound is less super aggressive than the V-rated tire. There's no harm to come from this unless you actually are going to drive in excess of 130 miles an hour for sustained periods of time. But, you know, the tire Nazis, as I style them, will not sell you that tire. Good grief. Mm -hmm. Now, this is just being done of their own accord. This isn't any regulation that's in place, right? No, it's no mandate, but it's become quite the thing with the big chain retailers. The smaller the mom and pop stores are, are more agreeable and won't do that. And by the way, these VINs, this, this data that they're collecting, they actually tap into the state DMV. So they're tapping into the government database. They, they get your license plate number and your VIN, and they can access all of the information about when your vehicle was last inspected, what service was done to it, whether it's past smog. I don't know for a fact, but I presume that they probably also have access to your DMV driving record. And again, these are private corporations. Well, in situations like this, it's kind of hard to, or at least it's more of a challenge to answer people who say, look, you libertarians are only concerned about the state, but corporations are pretty crummy too. So how do you deal with that as a libertarian? Well, they make a point. You know, unfortunately, and I weep for this, um, a lot of corporations have essentially decided if you can't beat them, join them. And they are adopting some of the same coercive methods that the government has used in which we decry. People, they've become even more aggressive in some ways than the government with regard to pushing some of these things onto people and claiming it's for safety. But in fact, it helps them make more money because they can add a feature to a car. And if it's a mandate, you have to buy it. And down the road, if it's a mandated safety equipment, well, you have to service it if the component fails or breaks or something happens to it. And that has become the new business model, unfortunately, for a lot of corporate America.